So we were reminiscing a little bit. This is a particularly kind of nice talk for me, in part because it's a really interesting topic, and I've been following Michael's work in this area for quite some time. But he was also one of my very first undergrads, so I'm aging both myself and you in, in the process. Um, but it's really exciting to get to watch our students do interesting things and follow their trajectories, and, and, and I hope you'll talk a little bit um, about your path to kind of get where you are. Sure. Um, but, uh, but it's great to welcome him back. So Michael Krautman joined the William Davidson Institute's Healthcare Initiative in 2015 after all sorts of other interesting things he's going to talk about. Um, but at the moment, his research and consulting work focuses on modeling, investment decision making, and strategy development to improve the operational efficiency and service levels of public health supply chains. While at William Davidson, Michael has developed several tools and white papers that inform key elements of the supply chain design and strategy development process. He's also conducted strategic evaluations of ongoing supply chain programs in several countries, helping clients improve their approach for providing technical assistance and delivering health products. He has both a master's and a bachelor's degree in IOE, here, University of Michigan, and then prior to WDI, he worked for a healthcare technology startup using predictive analytics to improve patient scheduling and post-operative care, and he also served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Zambia, where he evaluated clinic level supply chain practices. So welcome back, I guess, across the street now, but welcome back to IOE. Thank All you. All right, thanks so much, Amy. All right, well, thanks, Amy, for the introduction and for actually the invitation to come out and speak, and thank you all for, for being here today. Uh, so as Amy said, my name is Mike Krautman. I'm a research manager at the William Davidson Institute down at the Business School. And you know, today I want to talk about our work in health supply chain and really improving, you know, improving availability of medicines in health clinics in low and middle income countries, and through that, improving patients' access to health care. And so, actually, it might be helpful to take a quick poll of the room really quick. I and mean, how many of you have either from overseas or have lived extensively overseas? Quick show of hands. And how many people's work in, I assume everybody's healthcare focus, or at least has an interest in it, how many people have worked you know, in healthcare overseas as well? How about specifically low and middle income countries in healthcare? Okay. So we got a few. Um, so anyways, I, I think you know I have basically two goals for the talk today. Um, one of them I think is just to provide hopefully a little bit of a fresh perspective, maybe different systems, different problems, slightly different solutions than we all come across in our day jobs here. Uh, but then also you know I think that there are some lessons to be learned from our experiences in the setting overseas setting healthcare that can be applied really to you know any complex system. And so. Here's generally what I want to cover in the next hour. And you know, we'll start off with just kind of an overview of what I actually mean by health supply chain, in, especially public sector. And we'll talk a little bit about the work that WDI does to improve performance of these supply chains. I'll start off with some, you know, some technical modeling efforts that we've done, but also I really want to focus on that second part, which is really you know, getting into the broader system into which these supply chains are, are operating and looking at kind of the financial and the management systems that actually enable people to carry out some of these supply chain processes. <coughs> and then I think that's kind of where I see a lot of the takeaways um, you know, really being applicable to kind of broader complex systems anywhere. So for Amy's request, Here's a little bit of background on me and, and kind of how I got to be here today. Like Amy said, I'm an IOE major, uh, worked internships at you know, big kind of oil and gas corporation and then aerospace corporation, but then right when I graduated, decided to do the Peace Corps. Went off to Zambia for three years, uh, two of which I spent working with you know, small farmer cooperatives building out you know, aquaculture businesses, um, and then a third year I spent running around to different clinics in northern province in Zambia, uh, working with local health managers to basically troubleshoot you know, different supply chain issues and help them improve their supply of medicines. And as coincidence would have it, I happened to you know, have a couple of the districts that I was visiting overlapped with the districts in the paper that I think you guys were assigned to read. So I actually crossed paths with that, that study uh, while I was there. Um, they came back to the US spent a couple of years working with a couple of different startup organizations, and then for about the past five years, I've been at the William Davidson Institute on their healthcare initiative. And so, the William Davidson Institute, for those of you who aren't familiar, which I guess it's probably many of you, because we don't often make it up here to North Campus, 
Uh, so we are uh, you know, a nonprofit research institute housed at the business school at the University of Michigan. And we, you know, our focus is really on using business tools to improve you know, economic outcomes in emerging markets in various different sectors, including healthcare, finance, energy, education. Uh, you know, I think one important thing about the work that we do is that it tends to be applied. You know, we, we, we like to sort of bridge this gap between theory and practice, uh, you know, where the work that we do, like consulting work and our research is you know, rigorous and we engage with faculty members, but then ultimately our goal is to provide some practical analysis or tool for you know, a government or a donor agency to make an actual decision. So then, you know, within the healthcare initiative, we have four main focus areas that sort of span the entire really healthcare value chain. So at a big global level, we help donors and governments answer questions about how they should allocate their resources to maximize health outcomes. So you know, should I invest in, in this project or that project? Um, you know, we also work, work kind of on supply chain, which will be the focus of, of my talk today, which is really around how do you, how do you take those medicines and, and make them available in health clinics around the world. And then at the, the patient level, the healthcare provider level itself, we also work with different clinic organizations uh, to improve their business strategy, improve their operations. And then sort of underlying all of those things are information systems, uh, which then obviously helping people get data that they need to make decisions. And so within that supply chain bucket, uh, you know, the basic problem that we're trying to address here is really you know, the fact that patients oftentimes lack access to pretty basic medications, despite the best efforts of you know, governments and donor agencies. You know, we, we see uh, over there on the right that uh, you know, oftentimes you'll walk into a typical clinic and find that you know, half, two thirds of the medicines that they're supposed to have in stock actually aren't in, you know, aren't actually in supply, and we're only talking about you know, a hundred, two hundred different medications here. So a much narrower product range than like a typical CVS market, for example. Um, and so it's not, it's also, you know, it's not like the donor community and the governments are unaware of this problem. So they're you know, funneling basically billions of dollars a year into into providing medicine, purchasing medicines funding the resources to distribute them, funding technical assistance to help all of the people along the way. And you know, despite that level of investment, uh, you still see major challenges with, with access to medicines. And so I think one of the first things that we always sort of hear when we talk about this problem are people saying, you know, okay, well, maybe these medicines just aren't available in clinics because the clinics are hard to reach. They're off the grid. They're bad roads. They're inaccessible. And maybe the right answer is just to invest in new technologies to, you know, make them easier to reach. And so I included this little. Actually, I'm going to play with the laser pointer here. This little oops, doesn't work. Um, this little uh, headline down at the bottom with uh, the drone you know, delivery uh, company that's been valued at 1.2 billion, just to show that there are very serious people who you know, are willing to put forth a very serious amount of money behind this view, and you know, while I, I want to acknowledge the seriousness of infrastructure challenges in many countries, I think that it does create a very serious economic toll, uh, and if I, were, if I were in charge of things, that would be one of the first things I would invest in. But I think the problem with this view as it pertains to health supply chains is just that you, know, you see examples, despite the infrastructure challenges, you see examples of people and companies overcoming those challenges all the time. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you really only have health clinics where you have concentrations of people. And you don't tend to have concentrations of people in places that are truly inaccessible. Uh, you, you, where you have concentrations of people, you have, you, know, you have commerce, you have economic activity, you have companies you know, able to provide goods that meet people's needs. And so, yeah, my, my hot take of the day is that you can buy a bottle of Coke, a you know, tube of Colgate toothpaste, and you know, a Unilever bar of soap within, I don't know, two miles of any clinic in the world. Uh, just, you know, there are companies that are already bridging these gaps. You can probably buy a solar panel within like two hours of anywhere in the world, any clinic in the world. And so, you know, I think the way that I would frame this problem is that it's possible to serve patients 
in even the most remote places of the world because we, all, we already see companies doing that. And so the real question for us is, how can we bring the performance of these public health supply chains up to the level at which we already know companies to be operating at? And so that's you know, the framing that I'd like to really carry through uh, today. And so I guess let me take a step back here and you know, focus on what, what I actually mean by public health supply chains. Like what is the system that's supposed to be delivering medicines to patients? It really is a, is a global network. So starting from you know, the manufacturer level, you have pharma companies that are based out of the US and Europe and generic drug manufacturers, a lot of which are in China and India, even some located in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. And you've got all these different you know, donor agencies and multilateral agencies, so you know, the UN, the World Health Organization that are based sort of globally. And they're all you know, funding and distributing medicines to patients in low and middle income countries, which are for the most part in you know, Southeast Asia, Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Eastern Europe. And you know, in many of these countries, the public sector is sort of the single biggest healthcare provider. You know, a half to two thirds of all healthcare sort of runs through this big government ministry of health run system. And when we say publicly run, oftentimes from a supply chain perspective, we mean that the government literally owns the vehicles, employs the workers, you know, buys the fuel, and is responsible for actually executing all of those supply chain functions. And then I guess maybe one last point that's worth mentioning here is that there's generally an expectation that patients can't or can't pay at least for the full cost of healthcare at, you know, at the end service delivery point. So maybe they pay some sort of nominal you know, delivery fee, but uh, typically it's healthcare is just free. And you know, so while it could be similar to like a Medicaid system here where we subsidize healthcare for, for low income patients, Typically, instead of being some kind of an insurance mechanism or a, you know, a reimbursement mechanism that gets dropped in or, or money gets dropped in at the patient level, typically it's funded sort of from the top down. So like, we actually you know, push the product out and, and employ the doctors directly so that we can literally provide healthcare for free. Um, so everybody's getting funded out of a budget rather than out of a reimbursement. So then here's a quick quick overview of how the supply chain might be structured in many of these countries. We've got the, the orange is still the public sector that I was talking about there, um, which again is sort of the single biggest set of infrastructure that people have in terms of you know, health clinics and, and medicine distribution. We have, also have private sector uh, clinics and distributors, which oftentimes end up serving kind of a higher end market in, in capital cities. Uh, and then you also have a, a nonprofit sector, which tends to be relatively specialized. You serve a, a small number of clinics, for a relatively specialized number of, uh, of conditions and things. Um, I guess maybe one other point to mention here then is that you often see you know, different products. So you know, HIV products or malaria products or family planning products all take slightly different paths through this overall set of infrastructure. Next question here is sort of how, what is the process by which orders become deliveries? And what I have up there is kind of a screenshot of what is a pretty typical looking order form. So because most, most countries don't have their entire health facility network electrified, they tend to have the baseline infrastructure at, at the clinic level is all paper based. So you have these forms that people fill out every month or every quarter that basically you've got one row per medication type that you have, and across those columns, you just write how much you had in supply at the beginning of the period, how much you issued out, how much you received, and you do the math and figure out how much you should have in your storeroom, and then you go back to your storeroom and count it and write down how much you actually had, and if it's different, then you figure out how to reconcile that, and then you pull up the previous two months' paper forms and figure out how what your average monthly consumption was over those you know, those three months, and then you use that to figure out how you're supposed to, you know, how much you're supposed to be topped up to, to, to be in full supply. So how yeah. often is the amount that you're supposed to have and the amount that you actually have different? <laughs> <laughs> a fair bit. I mean, again, you're talking about, this is oftentimes like a nurse who has actual patient care duties, who's supposed to be, you know, who is practically filling this out in their spare time, um, and they're doing it with like a punch calculator, if, if that. And so, it's reasonable to expect the error rate on that to be pretty high. Um, no, that's uh, right. What I meant was, this is what came in. This is what I used. This is what should be left. Does stuff wander off? 
Um, yes, I think it does. Unclear how big of a problem it is. Um, what's more common, I think, is like, you know, some, some clinic will be short on a drug, and then somebody will go over to their neighboring clinic and just borrow some stuff from them, and maybe it'll get written down, maybe it won't. Uh, now, I would say it's probably more common. Uh, and actually, I forgot to mention, if anybody has any questions, please go ahead and interrupt. Um, better to ask them now than have everybody be confused. Um, so anyways, yeah, so then, you know, once this nurse is filling out this form, they basically send it upstream, and it gets, you know, validated by some sort of you know, district or municipal level administrator, and then either they, you know, fill the order directly or they kick it upstream even further. And then once somebody fills it, it's basically just a, you know, grocery shopping trip. They've got a list and they go back to the storeroom and they can pack and bag the order up and send it back down the way it came. Um, so I think there are sort of two general ways in which that, that process, where countries kind of riff on that process. Uh, one is just who's responsible for traveling at any point in the way, either to submit an order or to collect product. You know, you can have kind of a, a collection style system where facilities are responsible for traveling up to their district supervisor's office to go collect product and bring it back. Or you can have sort of, you know, a vendor managed type system where somebody at that district level then packs a truck full of medicines and drives around all their clinics and just sort of tops them up along the way. Uh, the second area then is you have you know, the timing of ordering and delivery. So, you know, the two examples that I just mentioned, uh, ordering and delivery happen simultaneously. So, you know, you submit the order, you get the product back, but you can also have that be separated. So, you know, maybe you phone in an order to somebody and then two weeks later, a month later, you get the shipment and it arrives. Um, and so there are obviously advantages and disadvantages to that. You can, if you separate those out, it gives you time to kind of batch everybody's orders together, do some troubleshooting, figure out if anybody's made some mistakes and rectify those. And then it lets you be more efficient distributing it out to people. But then, uh, you know, if, if variability is high or demand uncertainty is really high, then you run the risk of stocking out in that period between, you know, when you order and when you actually receive the delivery. So, I guess with that background in mind, maybe let me pause here for any questions. Yeah. So, if uh, who makes decisions on when you? supplies or drugs are added to that docket? Is it the clinicians asking for it, or is it kind of more top down as well? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know for sure. I mean, I think most of, in my experience, it's mostly been top down, but I don't know if that's applicable everywhere. My guess is it probably is. Like, you've got kind of a set list of products, and maybe once every five years, that list of products gets updated. But it's already pretty small. So you've got, like, a half dozen antibiotics, a couple, you know, anti-parasitics. So like, it would take a lot for them to want to adjust that list. Any other questions? How, how good is the system at dealing with um, a shelf life issues? Um, there are processes in place that are supposed to be able to handle that. Um, I think it sort of it varies by country how good they are. Uh, I also think that we don't really know how bad the situation is. Like the, the reverse logistics of getting expired medicines up the chain is not great. And so, you know, when you look at anybody's reported statistics on expired product, they're all pretty small, like one or two percent. But my guess is it's probably more like five or ten percent. Yeah, so and obviously the, the, the severity of that mm -hmm. would be very much a function of what the drug is. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Anything else? Sure. Even though the, the method that you described earlier is a very rudimentary method, mm -hmm. but still it has a good structure in it. Yeah, we'll, yeah so, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, so what my question is, like, based on your experience, mm -hmm. which uh, area is the most problematic or most uncertain? Like what part of that structure is most uncertain? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about it in more detail you know, throughout the presentation, but I guess I would say, short story is, I think like the actual execution of any of these different designs is sort of, is, is the part that fails most often. Like they tend to be pretty robust to, demand variability and, you know, like errors on your order sheet and that kind of thing. And it's more like when someone just doesn't submit an order or when someone just doesn't deliver, obviously then you see stock outs. Um, and then it's kind of that that we end up digging into a little bit more. Um, let me go ahead and move on here just for time's sake. Um, so I think one of the first projects that I worked on when I got to WDI was this really intensive modeling project where, you know, where we, we said, you know, in real life, you actually see a fairly wide range of performance from many of these 
real world supply chain implementations. So you know that, that 57% that I mentioned at the beginning is sort of an average, but you actually see quite a few models here and there that are over 90% or even 95% available. Um, and so the question is really how much how much is of that performance is due to the actual design of the supply chain itself. So you know where they're placing their warehouses, how they're you know what their inventory policy looks like, what what their strategy for actually delivering to health facilities is. Um, with the idea that if we can if we can replicate that performance or actually that range of performance with a model, then perhaps we can we can figure out some ways to for how to redesign some of these other you know, more struggling supply chains um, in a way that's relatively efficient. Um, you know, like the learnings could be applied to a lot of different countries, and so the way that we approached that was by building basically the biggest baddest simulation model that our money could buy. Uh, we partnered with Llamasoft, which is a local Ann Arbor-based company that, that puts out a pretty high-end supply chain optimization and simulation product. Actually, it gets used by a lot of big multinational corporations. Um, you know, so we've got like Walmart, Nike, Unilever, Ikea, those kind of companies. And, so, and they also do some work in, in, in global development. So they've worked with the World Food Program on optimizing warehouses for you know, food distribution and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, kind of figured that if it's, if it's good enough for Walmart, it should be good enough for lowly WDI. Uh, and so what we did was, was start with this clinic network that we had a really good data set for. It actually was the previous picture there uh, from Ebony State in Nigeria, where we had, you know, we had actual clinic GPS coordinates. We had a big history of, of demand for each month for several years for a bunch of different products. So like a, a good, uh, you know, a good basic structure for a supply chain. And then on top of that, we basically we, we programmed in these four different supply chain archetypes, I'll call them. So getting back to what I was talking about supply chain design, you know, you've got different ways of routing, different numbers of tiers that you have in the system, and you know, different frequencies of delivery and that kind of thing. And so we basically grouped, grouped those into four basic archetypes that we used as our, our baseline designs. And then within those, we programmed in a bunch of variability to count for different country to country differences. So maybe we might increase the overall area of the network while kind of keeping the same shape. We might make, concentrate demand you know, in urban areas to simulate you know, a highly, highly dense population. We varied frequency of delivery. We tested different truck sizes, all sorts of different stuff to basically kind of replicate the range of different you know, real life supply chains you might see if you had several different countries all sort of trying to implement the same design. Um, and then most importantly, we programmed in basically every kind of uncertainty and variability and error we could manage to fit in the simulation model. So demand variability, supply variability, order error rates, you know, reporting rates like actually like a certain probability of not submitting orders. Um, and, and so that ended up being you know, lots and lots and lots of different scenarios across these lots of different designs and lots of different country types to all see then how these different these four different designs respond to a variety of different conditions. <coughs> and on the surface, the results were actually were pretty interesting. So we, we got to kind of see how these different design archetypes performed relative to each other in this simulation model. And some of the results were actually a little bit surprising to us. So that kind of that model, the collection model I was talking about, where facility staff travel up to their district office and collect and bring it down, actually had significantly higher service levels than all the other models, even though in real life, we tend to see that one not do so well. Uh, similarly, the vendor managed inventory model that we saw tended to be the most efficient across most of the different scenarios from a cost perspective, uh, even though I think it has a perception in, in global health anyways for being pretty expensive. And then these results also showed, have pointed us towards opportunities to use sort of hybrid strategies. So you know, in areas where it's really you have a dense population, that the vendor managed inventory model is really cost efficient. In areas that are really you know, remote and diffuse, then that the collection model has a pretty high service level without really any you know, price penalty for it. Um, we, we don't really see those hybrid strategies that often in, in any of the countries that we work in. And so this kind of points towards that as one possibility for really optimizing design of the supply chain. Uh, However, there was sort of one overarching takeaway that kind of superseded all the rest of those, and it was just that when you look at the y-axis of those graphs that I showed, 
all of the supply chains perform really well in all of the different scenarios, you know, much better than they do on average in real life. Um, you know, so we see pretty much all the scenarios were over you know, 90 percent service levels, and they didn't really change that much as we, you know, as we dialed up demand variability, as we dialed up supply variability, as we changed the error rate. Like the the models as designed were very robust to all the different types of error. And the one way that we found that you could break them was just to have these whole sections of the supply chain process just not follow. You program into like, oh, I'm not going to submit an order. Oh, I'm not going to deliver for a couple of months in a row or a couple of periods in a row. And so I think the, the implication of that for us is that you know, beyond this certain threshold, which is pretty, you know, pretty small threshold, that stockouts and clinics tend or are likely to be driven by, you know, by challenges in actually executing any of these designs rather than the nature of the design itself. And so that's kind of that was the key takeaway for us from this modeling exercise was just that really any of those models could and should be effective uh, as currently designed. They're all they're all good enough to to provide pretty good health care to patients. And you know the fact that they don't uh, is probably more a reflection on the broader system in which they're operating. There's some sort of misalignment between this design and you know, the financing and the management and the human resources and, and the strategy environment in which that supply chain is operating. And so you know, the question for us then is sort of how do we, how do we find and fix those areas of misalignment? How do, how do we actually take a broader look at the system in which that supply chain is operating and, and figure out how we can better incentivize and, and you know, enable people to, to consistently carry out all of those, those processes that should, in theory on paper, work well. And that's what I'm going to talk about next here. So, you know, when I look back at a lot of the work that, that we've done at WDI on this topic, there sort of are a few sort of lessons, I guess, or experiences that pop out to me as being particularly relevant when you're talking about, you know, understanding why a supply chain design that looks good on paper, uh, you know, struggles to actually execute effectively in real life. And so I think, you know, these things, as I was writing them out, they kind of looked like they were relatively simplistic on paper. Um, but it, it's funny how hard won some of these lessons were. And so what I want to do is just kind of walk through each of these different examples, and, or each of these different lessons, and show you know, an example from our work of how, how we actually kind of came to that understanding. Um, so the first one there is really around designing solutions with people's goals in mind. It sounds obvious, but it's, it's surprising how often that doesn't happen, or maybe more, you know, more likely, people assume that that everybody else has the same priorities that they do, uh, and that that affects how they go through that. Second, then, is you know when when we're trying to streamline some sort of supply chain processing, one of the first places we always start is by mapping out how money flows through the system, because money you know and the control that goes with it are what drives a lot of the complexity in the systems that we see, and you know, complexity being sort of unnecessary in many cases. Um, I think similar to that, then you know, complexity oftentimes uh, makes it more difficult to to hold individuals accountable for the the piece of the piece of the puzzle that they're responsible for. And so you might have some some system that fails, and you can kind of narrow it down to like three people who are responsible for it. But then you know you have a hard time figuring out who was the one who actually was truly responsible for it. Um, and then finally, I think as we've as we've gone through a lot of our projects, and we've realized that it actually it doesn't take as much data as people think to be able to make decisions, or at least to get started down a road towards improvement. But actually, seeing that change through takes a lot more work and dedicated effort than people expect. And so, I think designing designing projects and solutions with that in mind can help can help people both get started down the road to change and actually continue that. So I'll start with the first one here, uh, designing around stakeholder priorities. So what we have here is an example from one of our previous projects. It's kind of similar to the one that's in the paper, but uh, not, not the same location. And we basically have two different supply chain pilots, each 
being sort of scored on one of or on seven different dimensions of performance. And the green boxes there sort of indicate you know, where one model is superior to the other model. And the question, the question that we're dealing with is which of these models is better? Like, which one should we move forward with? Um, actually, show of hands, or anybody have any comments on this, first of all? Anybody have any thoughts on which of these is better and, and, and why you made that decision? Sure. I guess it depends on what the main goal is, right? So if really the goal is to get medicine in the hands of mm -hmm. patients, then I would say B is better, right? Um, but if it's do that, then right. it really is a value trade off. Yeah, exactly. Any other thoughts? I have a question. Sure. In terms of the, the measure and efficiency, you're saying that how model A is beat out, how model B, I'm not sure. Is it worth measuring how much the white got deliver or measuring the cost of like the amount the same amount that got delivered? Yeah, so they, I mean, in reality, they both ended up delivering relatively similar amounts. Um, and this was sort of, this is actually the metric that we were given. I don't know. Um, we could debate what the best metric is there for that, but <laughs> <laughs> that would be useful. Gotcha. Yeah, it's basically just you know, total cost divided by total amount of product delivered. Um, but then, yeah. So I think you hit the nail on the head there. You know, when you when you're answering that question, it matters what your perspective is and what your goals are. And so if you're the minister of health and you're constantly used to getting you know send a budget up to parliament. And Parliament like makes you justify every little detail in the budget, and then they just slash it by thirty percent anyways if they can. Then you know money's constantly a problem for you, um, and you also have this wide range of different interests. You've got your nurses' unions and your doctors' guilds and angry patients who you know are beating down your door, and and you know and you've got lots of other competing priorities. So you know you're probably not likely to want to really upset the apple cart too much uh, because of all these other entrenched interests that you have. In contrast, if you're you know, the head of a donor agency, and maybe you're the donor agency that ran one of the pilots and your products are moving through the system. Like your, your mission is focused on health impact, and you know, money's probably an issue for you too, but the best way to get more money is to demonstrate more impact and demonstrate improved health outcomes. So you're actually interested in upsetting the apple cart. Uh, you know, no, no one's gonna fund anybody who says, yeah, I kept things the way they were and things didn't really change that much, so give me more money. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of see then how reasonable people might disagree about which of these options is best. And in real life, obviously, that is exactly the way that that played out. You know, so we ended up giving, the, I guess the context for this was that we got called in to provide the sort of neutral academic perspective uh, evaluation of the supply chain pilot that was contentious because the donor basically thought it was the bee's knees and wanted to scale it up everywhere. And the ministry actually really didn't like it. and wanted to shut it down for a number of reasons. And so we were kind of called to actually arbitrate that a little bit. Um, and obviously what, what, quickly, what quickly surfaced was the fact that while they both said we want to improve supply chain performance, they actually meant very different things by that. And this chart is the result of a survey that we gave them using an analytic hierarchy process, which is a, a multi-criteria decision analysis technique that basically gets used to you know, balance competing priorities when making a decision. Um, and so that clearly showed that the, the, two, the two different parties had very different things that they were prioritizing and had the donor done some kind of analysis like this, you know, in, at the outset of their pilot, they could have actually designed for the ministry's priorities and come up with a design that balanced all of those. But instead, they chose to kind of model one after their own priorities and then obviously caused a lot of, caused a lot of delay and you know, unnecessarily spent money and political tension in the process. Yeah. Can you say what's behind the national health strategy? That was the biggest. Oh, difference sorry. On yeah. The previous slide and the biggest difference on this slide. Yeah. So that, was, that that's kind of getting to the upsetting the apple cart thing. So they've got a whole national health plan that they come out with every five years, and it lays out you know how the different pieces of the healthcare delivery puzzle are structured and. Basically, if you want to if you want to get anything done within the Ministry of Health, you have to show how your project links back to this big national health strategy. So it's essentially a measure of um, how well, how closely it is, how close it is to the current system. Um, and so the, you know, the one of the pilot models obviously was very disruptive to that by changing around who was responsible for doing what, which then changes people's you know 
relative power, relative influence, that kind of thing. Is, yeah. is sustainability a surrogate for cost? Or, or yes, sustainability? sustainability is like the percentage of costs that are funded from internal government rev government revenues. So that's often, you know, governments, at least in my experience, have, are relatively find donors to be unreliable. So like they funding level might change from year to year, and so you kind of trust you trust your own resources more, and so the greater percentage can be funded internally than the more sort of control you have over the system. Um, donors also like when governments fund most of the stuff. Any other questions? So, yeah, I mean, main takeaway there, again, just, you know, by making those objectives and priorities clear, you can help inform and streamline the project in a number of different ways, both, you know, making the design objectives more clear. So what, what are the actual metrics that you're trying to solve for and which ones are prioritized the most? You also, lets you, you mean, it lets you understand better who you need to target your advocacy towards. So, you know, the, the people who are most likely to be resistant to a particular solution, if you want to move that forward, obviously you need to focus your attention on them to kind of win them over. Or you can kind of phase a rollout. Start with your start with the ones who are most likely to accept an idea and then kind of get all your kinks worked out there and then try to sell it to people who are more resistant. Um, obviously, also then in terms of monitoring over time lets you kind of better target metrics for dashboards and things. You can focus on the ones that are highest priority. So then financial flows, I want to go back to this diagram that I showed you at the beginning. It, uh, turns out that that's more of an illustrative diagram. And when you start adding in the funding flows, things get a little more complicated. Um, so this is an actual you know, map of goods, information, and funding flows for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, uh, back in 2009. And so the first thing you notice are all these parallel processes. So you've got kind of up along the top here, just different program areas. You've got HIV, malaria, tuberculosis. You actually have, all the way on the right, you see they have condoms split out as a program area from other contraceptives. So that's the level at which people are splitting these things down into silos. Uh, and then on that kind of the big middle stripe there, you've got 20, 25 different funding organizations that are all responsible for some piece of the puzzle. And that creates a number of different challenges for on the ground supply chain managers. The first one is just budgeting. So it's not uncommon to have lots of funders for a system. Like I bet if we go over to the hospital, they've got at least 20, probably like 100 different people funding various pieces of things going on. But in this case, what is unusual are the level, the extent to which those funders earmark their funds for specific things. So you know, USAID will fund only supply chain and only malaria. Global Fund will fund only HIV and malaria and tuberculosis, and so on and so forth. Gavi will fund only vaccines. And so you, you, know, you end up with these different funding buckets that are broken up by program area, but also by function, too. So you can't use Gavi health system strengthening funds for you know, procuring medicines, but you can use them for buying fuel for your land cruiser to distribute medicines. Uh, and so the second, second factor there is just the different funding timelines. So sometimes you have to make a budget request two years out. Sometimes it's one year out. Sometimes some funders have you know, disperse in June, some disperse in December. And so what you end up seeing is that you know, as a clinic manager, if you're trying to, you've got a whole set of different things, activities you need to fund, you don't necessarily know, you know, if you're going to one funder to ask for a certain amount, you don't necessarily know how much you're getting from all of the other funders, and you don't know what you can spend it on, and you don't know, you know, how much they're going to actually, you know, disperse to you, and so you end up having to basically estimate for each of these different groups what your needs are going to be, because you don't know what everybody else is going to fund. And so when you estimate, sometimes you're right, but when you're wrong, then the implication there is that some sort of supply chain function may not happen. You know, so you might have delay a delivery, or you might not submit an order, or something like that. Um, kind of building off of that, then, you know, you notice that in this diagram, that if you kind of follow a single path all the way down, that a product might change hands between two or three or four different organizations on its way to a patient, which you know, ordinarily wouldn't really affect the underlying process quality at all. But given the budgeting challenges then, you know, you, you end up then with now having three or four organizations that all have to kind of play their budgeting, you know, budgeting game and win it in order for the product to actually make it. And whenever any one of them fails at it, then they become kind of the bottleneck for that whole set of products getting through the system. So you basically, in this situation, when budgeting is so hard, then this increased coordination 
requires, it basically creates more points of failure. Um, you have more opportunities for somebody to mess up their, their, their funding situation. And then finally, just noticing the sheer number of arrows that are all moving between the same places. And the fact that, I guess it's not necessarily obvious from the diagram, but the fact that a lot of those boxes are actually the same physical location. So like, you know, you're talking about like that corner of the warehouse versus that corner of the warehouse versus this corner of the warehouse, or maybe two or three different buildings on the same compound. Uh, you know, so like you end up with essentially all these products flowing through the same places at each of these levels. And then the people who are working there, obviously then each of those arrows represents a different process, a different timeline, a different you know, set of requirements that they have to do. And so it's really hard, obviously, then to, to manage that system effectively when, uh, you know, when you have so many parallel processes going on. And so how do we address that? I think from, from our work, I think we found that there's no real easy way, like a, you know, a modeling or an optimization type solution to really fix this. It kind of comes down we found things like process mapping to be really effective at kind of a tactical level of figuring out how this actually works on the ground and finding these two boxes, these two situations where these two funders have a similar enough process that we can just go ahead and combine them and it won't affect anybody too much. Um, so kind of working at it at that tactical ground up level ends up being kind of the way that we've seen people make the most headway. Uh, and I think partly that's because people, it's often hard to realize how complicated the system is until you actually see it mapped out. Because you only ever see your little silo and you don't see everybody else's little silo. So like when I was running around visiting clinics in Zambia, it, I, got, I would be nine months in and I would still figure out, I would still find new forms that people were filling out at a clinic that I didn't know existed before. And it's only because like I just didn't, I wasn't involved in whatever that donor's you know, activities were. Um, and I guess also important to note then that, that when you talk about integrating these different financial processes, you're asking somebody to give up control of how their money is spent. And that's often something that's very contentious. And it's kind of incumbent on, on you as the person making this change then to really convince them that that payoff is worth the risk. And that's where I think advocacy becomes a big part of streamlining financial flows. And I think finally, you know, one thing that is sort of goes without mentioning here is just that the, you know, one of the best ways to get people kick-started down this road is just to highlight the problem in the first place. So, you know, going back to this diagram, I would, I would be willing to bet that DRC in 2019 is not nearly as complicated as this, and that this diagram was probably the biggest reason why it's not that complicated now. You know, because some saint of a person decided, like, took the time to actually make all those little boxes and all those arrows and put it in front of a bunch of decision makers, you know, faces that now like, people understand that this is this is actually a problem that actually needs to be solved. Um, but had that not happened, you know, who knows if anybody would have actually realized that it was as complicated as it is. And so I think you know kind of that, that idea of the find the figure that tells the story, you know, be, being able to succinctly describe the problem is often one really good way to to kind of kickstart action. And then designing for accountability. So kind of building off of that idea of complexity, I think one of the, you know, one of the things we find is that as these, as these systems become more complex, then it becomes easier for people to hide behind. So I already talked about that a little bit, but basically you see, you know, as, you know, as more steps and more stakeholders become involved, you have to spend more time you know, supervising and monitoring and collecting data to, base, to ensure that everyone's adhering to their, their, their roles. And then you also, it becomes harder to harder to align everybody's incentives around the same goal. So as everybody's responsible for a smaller and smaller chunk of the supply chain pie, there's a higher risk that then other pieces of their pie take precedence over you know over the supply chain in terms of what they're what they're incentivized to do. Um, and then finally, I think the accountability issue, like I mentioned, it becomes as you have more people involved, then you have more more challenges in terms of actually understanding and, and measuring and holding people account for their, their piece of the, of the pie. And so I guess a good example of this, I actually want to bring in one from when I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, 
a lot of stuff we do at WDI it tends to be kind of high level and it's, I feel like it's very context specific. But this is a, a pretty clear example in terms of actually, you know, redefining metrics to to improve accountability. And so one of the goals when I was when I was in the Peace Corps was we were we were trying to work with these district level health supervisors to you know to get them to focus on supply chain as, as part of their you know their, their normal health system um, you know outcomes that they were responsible for. And so we had these quarterly management meetings with the sort of the head the head district official for every single district in, in our province. And you know the the first time we had this meeting, our approach was really just to kind of show them the metrics that we were being held accountable for by our funders, uh, which were basically around stockouts. So, you know, what was the stockout rate for all the commodities and all the clinics in your in your district? And then, you know, in addition to that, then how many how many of the commodities were understocked, how many were overstocked, how many were stocked according to plan, and we basically just made graphs for each of those metrics, for each of those clinics, and or for each of the districts, and then discuss them all, you know, as a big group. And, you know, you can probably guess how that conversation went. Uh, it started off by people obviously pointing out, you know, hey, look, that 30% stockout rate that you were yelling at me for, that's actually because the central warehouse screwed up my order. Like, go yell at those guys instead. Like, let's, let's, let's fix them first, and then you can come back to us. Uh, they would also point out the fact that we have three metrics that are all sort of correlated with each other. You know, once you once you've stocked out of a product, you're also understocked out of that of that product, and you're not stocked according to plan. And so they kind of they didn't really like being yelled at three times for one mistake. Uh, and then most of them were just looking at their phones anyways, weren't really paying attention. Is the long point. And the people who did pay attention complained that the meeting took you know, two hours or whatever it was to actually work your way through each of those data points on each of those graphs for each of those metrics for each of those districts. And so the next time we had that, you know, that meeting, we kind of went back to the drawing board and really focused on, you know, th throw out our metrics. Let's focus on what this district district chief medical officer guy is actually responsible for achieving, and that is basically supplying timely and accurate clinic order data up to the central level. You know, in order to expect a timely and accurate delivery from the central medical store, they all agreed that they should have to be supplying timely and accurate data to them. Um, so we, we basically defined two new metrics, clinic reporting rate and clinic accuracy, um, or reporting accuracy. So basically the, the percentage of all their order forms that were submitted on time, and then the percentage of those submitted forms that were totally error free. And we kind of figured that if, if the district medical officers were, you know, got 100% for their clinics on both of those metrics that they get the gold star, and, and if, if they were ever stocked out, that it was somebody else's fault because they did their job. Um, and we also put all the districts on one graph. So these guys are all, you know, they're they're the bosses of their own district, but they're also in there. They like, kind of know each other, but they're also jockeying to be provincial medical officer or whatever the next step in the ministry chain is. So they all have an interest in looking good, and being able to put them all together on one graph kind of helps create that little bit of a peer pressure friendly rivalry situation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the conversation this time took on a completely different tone, which was really around, you know, A, they didn't really realize that they were making that many mistakes because no one had ever measured accuracy before. And so, you know, that was kind of a revelation. It also turned out that the ones who were performing the best actually had kind of the, had been dealt the worst deck of cards. You know, they had the, the most clinics the least budget, the clinics were pretty far and remote. And so they, you know, people were naturally curious as to why those districts were performing better. And so then that obviously led into some sort of a discussion of best practice. Like what were those districts doing that other districts copy? And so I guess I, I include this because it's a it's just a pretty cut and dry, clear case of how you know the metrics that you choose to show to people have a pretty strong impact on how incentivized they are and how, you know empowered, I guess you could say, they are, and to actually complete the things that you're trying to, to, to measure from them. And also then just that, you know, even within the confines of, of a single supply chain design, even if you can't make big, you know, systematic changes, there's still often a lot of opportunity for improvement at that, at that lower level. Uh, so I guess one last one here. There's this Amazon leadership principle uh, called bias for action that I think is, is one of you know one of my favorite le little 
mantras to, to repeat to myself. And I think it's important for health systems professionals, uh, just especially because our job you know, is somewhat unique in that it, it often is almost inherently defined by a constant you know, prodding for change and improvement. You know, like if, if you're a doctor or a nurse, you can fulfill the core function of your mission completely within the confines of, of a, a system. And you don't ever have to change a system to do your job well. But as an operations professional, you're constantly looking for how can I change the system to be better. Um, and so I think that it's important to focus on this because you know, being able to create an organization that's sort of naturally inclined towards that kind of action and change is something that will help, help make our jobs easier in the long run. Um, and I see you know, two main reasons why organizations or people kind of struggle to achieve that bias for action. One is just getting started in the first place, so figuring out what decision to make or what action to take. And then after you've made that decision and after you've started, we often see people struggle to maintain momentum. So there's some competing interest that comes up and then the, the change that you wanted to make kind of falls by the wayside and doesn't actually get all the way implemented. Wrong way. So in global health, what that looks like in terms of getting started, you know, one of the things we see is just you actually don't see a lot of you know, health ministry of health leaders conducting analyses of their supply chain, in part because the barrier to entry is really high. So that Lamasoft project that we did, uh, we, we probably spent like $300,000, but you know, two hundred fifty dollars to $500,000, three to six months is a pretty common estimate for how much time it takes to collect data, do the modeling, do all the consulting, because inevitably you don't really know how to use the software as well as they do, so you gotta, you know, got to have them help you with it. And so you know, most regional level you know, health leaders don't have, like, will never have that kind of budget. And the national level, you got to put that in the five-year plan. You know, it takes a long time to actually request that. And so as a result, not much actually happens, oftentimes. And then in terms of sustaining momentum, what we often see are just you know, conferences and workshops where people have really good ideas, and they take them back home, and they get started on implementing them. But then it, 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 inevitably, when people return back to their day jobs, it just that momentum kind of peters out. And so you often see, you know, you often see examples of pilots and things that that don't ever really get scaled up or you know don't don't live up to their potential because of this, you know, of this basically lack of, of continued momentum. And so, you know, what we've a couple of things we've done to try and address this. First of all, on the getting started piece, we've tried to, we've invested a lot of time and effort making these kind of light touch excel based decision analysis tools that you know come preloaded with proxy data and you know different heuristic little simple heuristics and really simplified supply chain structures all focused on basically getting you a you know getting you a rapid answer getting you an answer quickly that gets you 80 percent of the way there uh, when you don't necessarily need to spend five hundred thousand dollars on a tool that gets you 99 percent of the way there um, you know so these might be things like you know for the graphic on the right there, you know, which of these four different supply chain designs in kind of a rough, you know, high, medium, low, red, yellow, green sense is best aligned with these different aspects of my health system or, you know, which aspects of my health system are, are most in need of attention regardless of what kind of supply chain design I'm running. So you can kind of, with a few basic questions and logic, you can get to that point where you're, you know, you're getting a a rough sense then of which are the key areas you need to focus on, which are the key types of designs that are most likely to be successful, and then you can dedicate additional resources to, you know, to, to investigating those options further. We also have used this collective impact framework a lot in terms of you know helping large you know large supply chain organizations, um, either like the Ministry of Health or some big organizations providing technical support, uh, basically as a way to help them you know, view their role in, in terms of in making change. And so this collective impact framework is, actually it, it's interesting, I have a link down there at the bottom that would be a good read if anybody's interested. Um, but it basically is, a, is an approach for you know, achieving these complex, uh, difficult social outcomes uh, you know, things like improved test, you know, educational test scores in, in low-income neighborhoods or things like that, where you might have lots of different organizations that are working to address this, but not a lot of progress has been made. And the, 
you know, the, the framework is really focused on how you know how you can actually coordinate the actions of all these different players to to increase their their outcomes over what's currently being done. And so I think one of the one of the key pieces that we've pulled out of that is this idea of a backbone support organization uh, as kind of a driver of this whole collective impact. And so the thesis there is that people, you know, a project loses momentum when people stop doing the really basic functions involved in actually driving collaboration. So things like, you know, setting a setting meeting agendas and getting people together in a room and you know coordinating different stakeholders and you know holding people accountable, collecting data and sharing it amongst the group. So it's just like basic kind of project management functions almost that tend to fall by the wayside when they're not explicitly written into people's job descriptions. Or when they are, but then you give them a whole bunch of other stuff to also do, um, you know, such that they, they can't really prioritize that. And so, you know, what these what this collective impact framework uh, teaches and, and, and you know, organizations or groups that have been successful in actually implementing it, what they'll do is actually take that, that kind of core collaboration management function and put it in the hands of a single organization or a single person uh, who's just responsible for driving that. So they, they're the ones that are pestering people to get together and talk about this. They're the ones that are putting out the newsletters and the ones who are advocating for more funding and that kind of thing. And so I think this aligns particularly well with global health and, and global health supply chains because oftentimes you have lots of different organizations working towards this one common objective, but no one's actually responsible for kind of coordinating the actions of everybody. Um, you know, the Ministry of Health could do it, but oftentimes it's not, they don't necessarily see that as part of their mandate. So what we end up doing a lot is sort of advocating to them to consider this as one of their core functions. And, that's about all I have for you today. Um, you know, I don't. I, I think takeaway here is really just that for you know for projects to be successful in supply chain or really you know any complex environment, you really have to kind of balance that technical modeling, you know, optimization simulation type solution with an understanding of the broader system in which that solution is operating. And I think you know with that in mind, hopefully then you know you can you can achieve some sort of an impact that's greater than what you what you could with just that technical background alone. So I guess with that, I see potentially questions. We have questions, but I forgot to bring on my glasses. So we're going to uh -oh. start by thanking Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Any of Um, so you talked about the simulation model mm -hmm. and it really emphasized sort of the gap between simulation versus real world. You yep. brought up like the collection model as one example. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, and this might be part of your strategy alignment tool, but did any of the models have larger gaps than others? And could you get insights from maybe which policies are like harder to implement or like what maybe structures of models make it difficult for people to actually implement? Yeah, oh, that went away, sorry. Um, yeah, so I think kind of digging down into this a little bit, I think you see, let's see, I mean, I think the way that we see these models differentiate in real life, I think it boils down to kind of how well they align with those financing and management and, and HR you know, structures. And so maybe an example of how these models might differ in their impact on those systems would be like a collection model versus a vendor managed model. So like decentralized uh, financing of systems versus a centralized financing of systems. So like if you have facility staff coming to collect product you know, every month or whatever, then you've got, you know, say a thousand, five thousand different facilities in the country who you each have to top up with fuel budgets and you know time for the for the nurses or whatever to travel and for diems and all this stuff. Versus if you centralize that function in a district level, then you maybe have seventy or eighty districts that you have to fund, but the amount the amount is larger and needs to be consistent, or else they're going to have problems, you know, being able to deliver it everywhere. So you kind of you trade off this, you know, lots of little budget lines versus one big budget line. And I would say, you know ministries of health might differ in which of those they prefer um, or which of those they're better at. And so that would be an example of how you know different designs kind of 
like, interact differently with the system. What else we got? All right, Ellen. We'll take the cards. I have my glasses. This is all right. One more. Um, I saw, I think, a study out of maybe Purdue or something, but they talked a little bit about uh, some medications. This might be really niche, but like mm -hmm. some medications require food to uh, be okay. effective, mm -hmm. right? So, in addition to these medication delivery systems, they focus a lot on just like getting food to hospitals sure. as well, so they can mm -hmm. get those patients out of medication. And I'm wondering if like that comes into the logistical framework anywhere. Not explicitly in a lot of the work that we do. Um, you know, I, I do think that there there are dietary supplements and you know food type supplements that, that do kind of that are part of the clinic systems like like therapeutic um, biscuits and things like that for infants if they're malnourished um, but that's about the only extent to which the like the formal health supply chain kind of deals with that uh, but I would say that there are a lot of other initiatives and even just you know not initiatives but like organically pops up where like clinics because they're located in population centers tend to also be kind of centers of commerce and activity, and so it's usually pretty easy to go find food pretty close by. Uh, or if not, the clinics will, will bring people in to do, you know, to cook and whatever as well. Okay, so I'll ask one more from the cards, and then I suspect as we break up and start going to your smaller groups, some of the questions will come out. Um, but you talked a little bit at the beginning about uh, drones and some other methods for mm -hmm. delivery. Can you just talk about how much that's actually um, started to be implemented in practice? and sort of the different alternative mechanisms for actual, the actual delivery of the supply chain? Yeah, so there's a lot of money being pumped into drones. Um, so that, that zip line was an example. They operate in Rwanda pretty extensively now doing like blood transfusion, so de delivering bags of blood for transfusions. Um, I think they've started up operations in Tanzania and a couple other places. There are a lot of people doing like pilots or proof of concepts. Um, for a lot of different countries, but I don't think you really see, you don't really see it becoming institutionalized really anywhere except that one specific like Rwanda blood transfusion example. And part of the, part of the, I mean, there are several issues that need to get worked out. Like, you know, if you're a little drone manufacturing company, are you responsible when that drone you know, crashes out of the sky and hits somebody and kills them? Or if it's one of the ones that, you know, has to like land on the ground to deliver product and somebody pushes the return to sender button and then, you know, chops off a finger or something like that. Like, there are, there are legal implications and liability implications of that. Um, yeah, and so I think like those types of issues, I think, have, have prevented a lot of people from really you know, making a ton of headway onto that. But there's a lot of there's drone you know, working groups and lots of drone grants and things like that from different donor agencies that are all trying to push this forward. All right, let's go ahead and thank Mike again. <laughs>